Hey everybody, welcome back to Video Game Esoterica and our side series on a technicality. And today what we're going to be doing is tearing down and swapping the battery in the Apple Bandai Pippin prototype I picked up this year. And the reason we're doing that is because the save RAM is battery backed. And this piece of equipment is from 1995 and it is not saving anymore. You can save while you're playing and you have power, but if you turn it off and turn it back on, your saves are gone. And that's something that's super common in pretty much every console, the Saturn, things like that. The only difference between a normal console and a Pippin is it is not really user serviceable. Getting to the battery is the biggest pain in the butt I've ever had to deal with as far as swapping a battery is concerned. And since people do collect these and the battery is an issue, we want to switch it out and we're going to show you guys how. The other reason we want to deal with it is because those batteries can leak and ruin the PCBs. So what we're going to need is a multimeter. We have a screwdriver here with a Torx T20 bit. We need a paper clip with a decent length. And then we need a replacement battery. It's a 1 half AA, 3.6 volt, and the code is 14250 on the battery. And since we did get this battery on Amazon, and I'm a little disappointed because the manufacturer date isn't very recent. We're going to check the voltage because I don't want to tear the entire Pippin down to put a battery in that's going to end up being flat. So how you do that is you just hook your black test lead into COM and you hook the red test lead into that omega sign, which is going to be testing for resistance. And we just dial the meter up to one level above the voltage. There's two and there's 20. Since we're looking for 3.6, we'll turn it to 20. And like I said, this battery, unfortunately, it's looking for 3.6 volts, but the manufacturer date is 2003. And I'm really irritated about this, but I got the battery. I wanted to make the video. Let's do it. So you put your negative lead onto the negative terminal and your positive lead onto the positive, And we see we get 3.6 six volts on the meter so we know this battery is good i wish it was newer but that's what we're dealing with now when you're dismantling the pippin there is a ribbon cable that controls all these buttons and it leads into the left hand side of the console if you tear this ribbon when you're removing everything you're going to have a really bad time remaking it it's an annoying design i don't know why they did it that way there's going to be eight screws on the bottom four hold the bottom of the case and four hold the top we're going to remove them all at once and i just highlighted where those screws are here and that is that torx t20 bit that you're going to be using but just go ahead and pop all four of those off and put them in a cup or something you don't want to lose your screws i've done it before but since everything is separated and we don't want to put any stress on the plastic sandwich it between your hands and turn it and then you're just going to have to start to try to pull this plastic off the top it's old it's slightly brittle and it doesn't come off smoothly so be careful it does pop off but you don't want to break any of the plastic in there because it's not like you're going to be getting a replacement pippin shell anytime soon but now that we have removed that top you want to open it very carefully and pinch the ribbon cable in your thumbs and remove it i don't know why they went with this design i wouldn't have done it but that's how it is and you don't want to break that cable so right in front here, there is another screw underneath the CD-ROM drive tray. So we're going to use that paper clip and just like old CD-ROM drives on computers, you just push it in there till you feel resistance and the tray is going to pop out. And you will see that there is one gold Phillips head screw behind there. This screw is a pain in the butt to get to. I start by going over the tray and I finish by going under, but you don't want to put any stress on the tray. Technically, the drive tray face is supposed to come off, but mine doesn't feel like it is. It'd be a lot easier if we could do that, but unfortunately on mine, I'm not going to stress the plastics too much. So if you use this method to get that front bezel off, it works. It's a little fiddly, but that's how it happens. So now that we have that screw out, we're going to take the bottom off. And again, just be careful with the plastics. They are quite old. We don't want to crack anything when you're doing this because you can't replace it. But there's going to be two plastic retention tabs on the sides here. Just get your fingernails underneath them and pop them right out. And there was a gigantic hair in mine. I don't know where that came from. It doesn't look like mine. And you're going to pop those two off in the top as well. And then just slowly slide that plastic bezel forward so we can open up the top. And there are wires. You're going to have your four pin audio cable. You're going to have your SCSI wire, and then you're going to have your four pin Molex like connector. And I will say that four pin power connector is on there so tight. I could not get it off. I didn't bother. But the nice thing is there's enough cable length that you can just put the CD-ROM tray and lid off to the side. And now that we're inside of the Pippin, there's our power supply. If you ever need to service that different chips, and then we have that battery, which we need to replace. So taking a look at that, it's just sitting in here in a little plastic housing, but it does have a lid on top of it. 
I could not get my fingernails underneath the plastic, so what I ended up doing is coming in with a very low profile flathead screwdriver. And all I do is get that little head underneath the plastic tab and ever so slightly turn it until it pops. Don't do it too hard. Don't stress the plastic. It's all old. But once that comes up, all you do is get the screwdriver in the other side and continue to turn it as well. And with any luck, it should pop right out. No big deal. And then like any battery, just grab it with your fingernail and pull it back. And since we couldn't get the system to hold saves, we're gonna come in and check this battery. And it was manufactured in 1995, and I'm impressed it hasn't leaked. And that's why the number one reason we do these things is these batteries leak electrolytic fluid and it ruins board traces. But if we check the voltage, it has no voltage. This battery is 100% flat. It's actually showing a negative 0.02, which is just a fluke. But if we take a look at that new battery again, you see we're supposed to be getting 3.65 volts. We have 3.66, so we're good to replace it. And if you've ever replaced any battery, just pop it in. Make sure that your negative and positive terminals are correct, as you can see there, and you just put that top right back on and push it in. And since this is a prototype, you can see that Kinka ROM as well, non-engineering sample. And this is just what makes it a prototype outside of some stickers and other design things. It's got that prototype ROM board in there. So to put the unit back together, we basically just reverse the steps. First thing we want to do, and being careful of that bezel and CD-ROM tray because it is still out, is we just want to drop the top CD-ROM caddy in the area that it needs to be. And then from the back, we're going to lift up gently and we're going to reinsert the SCSI cable and the four pin audio cable. It is keyed, these pins can be delicate, so just make sure you're not trying to jam a square peg in a round hole. And this connector in particular is quite narrow, and you can see I have a little bit of trouble getting it back on, but just take your time, be patient. It is keyed, so you can only go one way, and you will get that cable to slot back in, because that's where all your audio from the CD-ROM is coming. Once those are there, just make sure you don't pinch any cables in the back on that metal case. It's not sharp, but it would still definitely damage it. And just get it to sit down just like that. And then we're not going to show you putting all the screws back on, but there's four screws on the top. And just make sure you get all of those in because we don't want this shifting. It is a very compact unit like a computer and you don't want to screw anything up. And then just push the bezel back in on the front and make sure both of those locking tabs on top and both on the side are sitting in there nice and tight. And then you just want to make sure you don't forget this screw on the front because if you forgot it, it wouldn't be the biggest deal in the world, but it does hold the center of the bezel in place. And since it came off the unit, we want to put it back on. And again, you have to go a little bit under, a little bit over, unless you have a really tiny screwdriver that fits in there. Push the CD-ROM drive in and you're good to go. On the bottom, the plastic is very similar shaped. You can see there's doors for the RAM expansion as well as that uh, special form factor PCI extension. So just make sure you line those up. The four outer screws attach to the top case. So you don't want to put those in yet. And this is where you're reinserting that ribbon cable. I did this off screen. It took me 10 minutes. It is the most annoying thing to put back in. It slides in like any ribbon cable does, but just be careful and take your time. And then we'll go ahead and just put all the screws in the bottom. And the last step is I'm just going to write battery changed 920. And I'm going to tape it onto the bottom of the case because I have a lot of hardware and I change batteries pretty consistently and I can never remember when I did it. This way it's non-destructive, that tape goo, if it stays on the case, will come off easily. But I know now that that battery's been changed on September 20th, so I'll probably deal with it again in five to 10 years. And don't just throw your battery in the trash, try to recycle it, be a good person. But that's how you swap a battery on an Apple Bandai Pippin, and that's the teardown. Thanks so much for watching. If you could do us a huge favor, go down below, hit like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. It takes a lot of time and energy to make these videos. We'll be back on Sunday and Tuesday with videos as well. But if you have any other questions on your Pippin, if I can answer them, go ahead and leave me a comment below and let me know what's going on and I'll see what I can do. Short of that, bye bye